I guess it's fitting we wrap up an ecology course with a look at conservation biology. We have to face the fact that the impact of, on humans on the earth has been a very big one. We control or affect much of the earth's surface. More than 35% of the land is cultivated or has been transformed to pasture land. Tropical forests are still being felled at 17 million hectares per year. Some years it may be a little slower, some years even a little more. And deforestation has led to desertification, the land becoming dry and useless, especially in Africa. And all over the world, air and water pollution is widespread. This deterioration of the environment will lead to declining quality for human life. And already, many other forms of life on the planet have been affected. But I think there's hope. I think humans can lean in a, live in a clean and sustaining world. But only if we place the things that support our own population into balance with preserving other species and the ecological processes that many species are involved in that sustain and nurture humans. It's pretty clear that environmental problems can't be solved until human population growth is brought under control. And also, consumption by individuals already present has to be reduced. Consumption of energy resources and food produced at the higher trophic levels. Ecosystems that are maintained as close to their natural state as possible have the natural processes intact and contribute to the health of the planet for benefit of humans. So how can this happen? We've already grown to numbers that exceed the capacity of the Earth to support the hum current human population at the level that those of the most fortunate of us enjoy in the developing world. Many people live in poverty with no resources, and as they come to acquire and demand more, the resources on the earth are taxed even further. But how can we live more sustainably? I think it's really important that some of nature is just left to itself. There are many parts of the world where Agriculture and grazing were not going to work very well, but people have used the land for that and have ruined it, becoming dust bowls, etc. Maybe those areas, hard to cultivate, are best set aside for conservation. It's almost always preferable to live with nature, and it's also less costly than going against nature, changing things that then have to be repaired. In many of the places not that well explored, some unspoiled, there may be 10 or more million species of organisms and only 1,500,000 species have been catalogued. Species lists are only one approach to documenting biodiversity but biodiversity also includes many unique attributes of living things. I thought it might be worth pointing out some of our local species that are endangered, so you can be a little familiar with them. The Everglades kite is a beautiful bird, the Florida panther, symbol of FIU in a way, the golden panther, wood storks, unusual birds, manatees, Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow, the Miami Blue Butterfly shown in this little picture, the crenulate lead plant, and the tiny polygola. Let's look at pictures of these and I'll tell you a little about them. The Everglades kite depends on snails for its livelihood and as the Everglades have been drained and diminished uh, the kites' populations have been negatively affected. The Florida panther on the bottom, this is such a cute picture, I think, needs 
large areas to sustain their populations by hunting. And the fact that the southern part of our state has now crisscrossed with many highways has killed many panthers. Their numbers got down to less than 40 in the mid-80s, but after some genetic um, problems were noted among the um, In the upper left is the gentle giant, the manatees, large, slow-moving herbivores that run into problems when they're cut up by fast-moving boats along our, our warm shorelines. Upper right is the Cape Sable seaside sparrow, whose habitat has been much altered by draining and they are nearly extinct. The lower left, the wood stork, whose makes their nest only when waters are at a certain level and different years with different water patterns have put their populations in jeopardy. And the lower right, this roseate spoonbill, I didn't mention that in my list, but this is also an endangered species whose numbers have really waned in the last 20 years. One of the most endangered plant species in Florida is the crenulate lead plant whose original habitat was ephemeral glades, ephemeral waterways going through the rocklands of um, the Miami Rock Ridge. But as the landscape was transformed, the habitat for this plant disappeared, and the few sites where it persisted have been mostly developed. And the tiny polygola, also highly endangered, short-lived uh, small plant pollinated by ants, maybe seeds dispersed by ants, that seems to disappear from areas where it was known, then sometimes they'll come back after a disturbance, but basically their um, distribution is much diminished and getting smaller. There's a few species endangered in the Florida Keys as well, including the key deer shown here, beautiful little deer about the size of a German Shepherd dog, a small German Shepherd dog, the Key Largo wood rat in Bartram's hair streak in Florida leaf wing, butterflies, and the sand flax, Linum arenicola. Here's the Florida leaf wing butterfly, the cute green caterpillar with the red stripe. And you can see looking at the adult why it's called a leaf wing. They eat, the caterpillars eat croton, linearis. And Bartram's hair streak caterpillars also eat croton linearis. This plant itself is less common as pine rockland areas have been developed. And these are common in the, these are formerly found in South Florida and the Florida Keys in pine rocklands. Bartram's hair streak is a beautiful butterfly. And you can see the projections on the end of the wing opposite the head end. Here's the head. Here's the end of the wing, the butterflies move their wings so it looks like that's the head end and it helps them avoid being eaten by butterfly, by bird predators. So not only endangered species are threatened, but more widespread species as their populations shrink and um, numbers diminish, we lose genetic diversity as well. And some of our native species, our ancestors to crop plants, in undiscovered species may hold properties that could benefit humans that we don't know about. And populations of the same species in different regions may have different genetic, or definitely do have genetic comp compositions. So... Not only is it important to maintain different populations, but endemic species that occur nowhere else in the world. One interesting plant I want to point out to you is the so-called man in the ground, Ipomoea microdactyla. And Dr. John Geiger, one of our bioinstructors, studied this plant for his PhD. It's endangered at the state level in Florida, but also found in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, and Cuba. 
And it's obvious from John's genetic studies that the Florida populations may have come from the Caribbean. So this colonized South Florida from the Caribbean. And some plants have this distribution. They may occur other places in the world, but in some cases they're the genetics of those populations may differ. In fact, islands are well known for harboring endemic species. Most birds, plants, and insects that live on isolated islands live nowhere else in the world. And so the loss of island species, caused often by introducing non-native species or humans developing the island, means worldwide extinction for those taxa. And indeed, humans are responsible for many extinctions of island endemics. So we're currently losing species at an all-time high in Earth's history. On average, we lose one species per day. And Historically, extinction happened at a much slower rate of about one species per year or per decade or per century. So why should we be concerned about losing species? After all, many are gone already, and extinction is a natural process. Extinction raises moral issues. I think it's our moral responsibility to protect nature and to consider that non-human individuals and species have rights as well as we do. Not only do they have rights, but to most people we can um, get them to be concerned about extinction if you make everyone realize that there are economic benefits that could help humans in almost every species. A lot of, well, all of our food and game Natural products that come from forests and drugs and other chemicals come from plants and animals. In the, at the top is a game animal, a beautiful, I think it's an oryx. There's garlic, the fleshy leaf bases of a monocot we use in our daily cooking. And on the lower right, ginseng with important medicinal properties. We can see that policies that have favored some species have harmed others. We have cultivated a few species to the exclusion of many uh, natural organisms and natural habitats that had lesser value. Some organisms that were in conflict with human um, agricultural operations, like wolves, have been eliminated because they would eat sheep and cattle. And certain natural resources that we enjoy eating, using like fish, have been overexploited, leading to their demise. One argument for preserving nature also is ecotourism, because attractive plants and animals in interesting, adventuresome places can attract tourists who will bring in much needed currents, foreign currency into the economy of developing countries. And ecotourism, in fact, is responsible for developing parks and preserves. The potential, however, of ecotourism is finite because not all ecosystems are attractive to tourists. 